Good afternoon. Good night. Is it good night? Good afternoon. Good night. Whichever, either or, depending on how you get down. I'm John Browner. I'm joined by Jason Lawhead. And this is a little something we like to call Browner and Lawhead, people. That's right. We are coming to you on the Mightier 1090 ESPN. ESPN Mightier 1090. There we go. And we bring y'all sports. We bring y'all entertainment. We're available on YouTube. We're available on the iTunes podcast or all under the banner of Kaplan and Crew, the thing you see behind me. Shout out to everybody out working on a Monday. What's up, Jason? What's going on? Big sports weekend, man. Yeah, man. Uh, I think it's like, I think this time of year, I think it's technically good afternoon at six o'clock this time of year. And then like uh, when the, you know, kind of like the fall and winter it's good evening so i say i say it's good afternoon still at 6 p.m but uh yeah interesting uh sports week uh first two games of the nba finals uh, obviously the first one was kind of a you know uh, a head shaker a little bit but uh i think it was a little bit more was expected in game two some some fun other news baseballs you know kicking into gear and uh phil mickelson put out a big statement today about how he's returning to golf and he's going to play in these liv you know uh tour dates and he's going to uh um play in the majors and the ones that'll have him i guess if it's still like uh, uh the pga so there's some interesting stuff going on you know it's uh it's a wor- wide world of sports you know, it's we'll we'll get to we'll, you know we'll get to Phil Mickelson. We'll talk about some Phil Mickelson. We'll talk about what happened and what's happening with the Padres and their rebound after being swept by the St. Louis Cardinals. We'll talk about the NBA Finals. I also, want to talk about Elon Musk for a second um, at some point. So we got a lot of stuff in the bag today. We got to take out and, and and get to. But the first thing I want to talk about is when we are <clears throat> experiencing things. You either have two options. You can let one day run into the next day, whether it be good or bad. You can have the next day bring down the following day. Or you can look at them as individual things. Like what happened to me today won't happen to me tomorrow. The person I am today, I will not be that person tomorrow. You can try to be better every day. To me, that's what the Boston Celtics are now. They're just going to try to be better every day. Even though, you know, sometimes it just doesn't go your way. I thought them winning that first game and the fashion in which they won it, outscoring the Warriors in the fourth quarter with a barrage, make, I think, a seven of eight threes after the six-minute mark. I thought that that run would give them a level of confidence that should have spearheaded them into the second game. It didn't. Because if you remember the KD Warriors, because that's what I called them, the, when the KD Warriors beat the Cavs in the infamous J.R. Smith rebound game, J.R. Smith rebounds the ball, runs it out. I believe, and I, and I say this wholeheartedly, if the Cavs would have won that game, I think the Cavs would have won that series. I think that moment was so deflating, it just scrambled them. And they went, and after that, they had blown such a great opportunity. I think LeBron checked out after that because they got swept. Yeah. They got swept that year. And I think that moment, LeBron checked out. And I thought the exact opposite happened for the Celtics after winning in a fashion in which they did, that they like, wait a minute. We can beat these dudes. And not only can we beat these dudes, I think we're better than them. We warriors the warriors. Mm-hmm. And then last night was like, Al Horford, two points. Marcus Smart, two points. And all credit goes to Robert Williams. Two points. Bro, stop playing. Stop playing. I I get it. Ime Udoka, they need him. It's the it's the competitor in you. It's the fight in you that wants you, wants you to keep going, wants you to play hurt, because you can still give the team something. I hope that's the last time we see Robert Williams. Because that doesn't look good for him. It doesn't look good to watch. And to watch Marcus Smart then fall on him makes it seem like he's putting his career at jeopardy a la Grant Hill when Grant Hill was never the same after playing on a broken foot in a playoff game for the Detroit Pistons. So these two games don't tell you anything about the third game other than that now they have to go to Boston. 
Yeah. I think if there's anything that these two games maybe tell you a little bit, if I'm concerned if I'm Boston, I, I'm really high after game one if I'm Boston. But then after this second game, I'm brought down to life a little bit. And and, and, and life reality is to me, boy, I, I hope that fourth quarter wasn't a fluke. I hope that wasn't a Golden State team thinking, man, we've done this to teams all day. Nobody's coming back. This is home. This is a game one in the back. And then bing, bang, boom, 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 boom. We're a little tired from the rest and just kind of uh, hitting a young team late. And they hit us with a punch that we just can't get up from. Sometimes great fighters just get, they just get hit. And that was the one loss on their, or the, you know, the two, one of the two losses in their 50 some fights. My point is, is that, you know, you take away that 40 point for fourth quarter. And you take away that 30-point first quarter in game two where the Celtics did look like they came out and asserted to themselves. And, and I'll say this. I think Udoka made a, a mistake here. It, one gut instinct, coaching instinct I would have did if I was Udoka last night, right? Because no matter how, no matter if you play really well and you just don't get that win or if you, or if you play badly and you get beat and you get rolled over, you got out of Golden State with one. You know you're getting right. out of Golden State with one, right? right. So I thought – at I think it was 22-15, Jalen Brown picked up his second foul, and Jalen Brown was playing great at that time. Jalen Brown was hitting everything early on, and he was in that groove because he was out on the floor and he hadn't been taken out. And I, and I even tweeted it. I said, man, if I'm Udoka, I, I'm keeping Jalen Brown in there with those two, uh, and I'm telling him, play like you got one. Keep playing. Keep jamming the ball down their throat. Keep getting to spots. Keep, keep you know, pop, hop, you know, Pop, popping and shot in transition. Uh, uh, keep that defense aggressive out on it. Because I think the, the slowest and the worst Golden State looked was out of the gate. And it was the yes. best Jalen Brown looked all game long. And when he had to go sit and then didn't get put back in until the second quarter, he was not in rhythm anymore. Uh, uh, Golden State had picked up the tempo. They had got right back in the game. I mean, he went to the bench at either 22-13 or 22-15. And Golden State not only got right back in the game, they got that lead early. Steph was starting to free himself. He was starting to get nice, clean looks. Then mm -hmm. Poole was coming off the bench in that rotation. You knew Poole was coming back on the floor, and you knew you were going to get stretched defensively, or at least, you know, Golden State was going to try to do what they were going to do. And I think that's where the, pay, the, the, the game changed. I just thought, if I'm a coach right there, and I feel like I can get two right now. I can get two. I can get out of here 2-0 if Jalen Brown goes and carries us through this first quarter. Because Tatum started a little slow. He was getting to the free throw line. But then Taylor Cook started cooking, or Tatum started cooking. But, you know, that, now you got to be going concerned, going, well, we got a game out of Tatum. And then other guys went went away that, that were big in that late run. They went away for all four quarters. They never showed back up in that fourth, third or fourth right. when we needed them. So now what are we going to get out of them? And so – as much as I would have felt great after that fourth quarter, you know, like you said, they warriored the Warriors. Uh, then what happened was you look at the Warriors and they go, hey, look, we scored 108 and we scored 107. We've been where we've wanted to be in two games at the NBA Finals. They needed a 40-point quarter. And if they don't get that 40-point quarter, they've scored 88 and they had 80 going into the fourth. So, um, yeah, they were they were playing well still going into the fourth because they, they had that late third quarter surge in game one. but. It's going to be interesting to see who dictates the tempo. Uh, is Marcus Smart going to be game one Marcus Smart? Is Al Horford going to be even a version of game one Alfred Hor Al Horford? I mean, you, you you don't even need that whole Al Horford. But, boy, no, not even an ounce. Two points? Version, not even an ounce of that version came yesterday. And the Robert Williams thing, you know, you kind of just got to coach by – instinct there can he help you when he's out there do you limit his minutes he's still a big body you know you go look at the stat sheet and we talked about this before the series uh you know you can you can still outscore golden state at points in the paint and they can still beat you but you can't be outscored by golden state at points in the paint and yesterday they destroyed boston in a lot of statistical categories and that's not a good breakdown because you know like i said you look back on it and the really only statistical category that that Boston has owned in this series is that fourth quarter in game one. One of the things that I find fascinating about this is as much as people made about Al Horford, Robert Williams, and Marcus Smart having two points apiece, Clay Thompson has been awful yeah. two games in a row. And I mean, just absolutely awful. And the Warriors won the first game, and the Warriors won the second game going away. 
and they should have won the first game, probably in a similar fashion, if not a little closer than than it than than you know they would have liked. But Boston pulled it out. They're in this position with getting next to nothing from Clay Thompson. Right. Next to I mean, he got into the act eventually yesterday because it was the get you know it was getting good you know everybody was getting a little when it was getting good he he got kind of yeah he was two for fourteen right but in the yeah in the competitive nature of that series so far terrible he has not been anywhere near the guy I even tweeted that last night I said hey you know this guy just doesn't have the off the ball off the screen pop out separation type of game that he used to have he's just. You know, he's still dangerous with an open look, but he doesn't he doesn't create or get those open looks off of what he used to be off the ball, coming off of screens, rubbing and and quick catching, separating. And uh But you yeah. also can't treat him like somebody you also can't treat him like a person where, oh, we could just leave him. And so to me, this is the brilliance in Steve Kirby and like, you know what? Figure this out, dude, because we're gonna leave you out there because they're not gonna leave you open. Because right. by chance they leave you open and you start making them, then all hell's going to break loose for them. And then they have to guard you and Curry. And Curry has been absolutely fantastic. So I think that the difference so far has not been the people who have shown up. It's the people who haven't shown up in this series that has really gotten my attention. And that includes Draymond Green, who didn't show up in the first game for whatever reason. And then showed up in the second, showed up in the second game doing Draymond this. Green. Oh. If you're Draymond Green, you got to be careful. You already have a technical foul. And if you're Jalen Brown, you got to try to entice him. Absolutely. And in a normal course of a game, this would be a, a double team. I think Brown took exception to Green's legs being on him as he fell. So, look, I don't – people love Draymond Green. People hate Draymond Green. I'm on the I'm on the not a fan part of Draymond Green. Yeah. Because to me, if, you, if you've played enough basketball, there are certain things that guys play hard, and it's super annoying, and you hate it. But they're not dirty. They're just playing hard. They're, like Zach, Zach Randolph was massively physical. He didn't play dirty. He just – Hurt it hurt to play against him. He imposed, Deal, yeah, you're right. Yeah, Shaquille O'Neal wasn't dirty. It hurt to play against him. What Draymond Green does, that's not basketball. That's that's antics. Right. That's what they that's what people kill Pat Beverly over. To me, at this point, Draymond Green is Pat Beverly with rings. That's <laughs> it. That's it. Because that's not basketball. And you're in the NBA finals. He's already cost his team a championship. By his situation with LeBron. Because if that had been somebody else whose shorts he pulled down and whose feet he had put their head on, he'd be out of the game. So I, I just think that he's taking advantage of the fact that the Celtics are a young team and they don't have the finals level of respect that somebody like a Giannis would or a or a Joel Embiid would or a, a LeBron would. Because if he'd have done that to a couple of other guys I can think of off the top of my head, that would have been a second technical and he'd have been out of there. Yeah, it's interesting too. Like he he really goes and he tend he tends to he tends to muck up things um, yes. more than he actually like yesterday. Like you said, he didn't show up in game one. He didn't really even show up much in game two. He mucked up six points, game. five he, rebounds, four assists. He mucked up game two, right? Yes, he helped uh, kind of uh, an early you know Warrior team struggling with their game out of the block. They weren't playing terrible, but they sure weren't off. The, the schneid you know getting what they wanted early it was boston out early you know, establishing that nine point lead in the first quarter and that's when draymond started going into the muck right i mean boston was playing physical basketball early yeah. on they actually were up nine i think and they were up you know already in the bonus before the warriors may have even committed a team foul or two but that's when draymond started going to work into that you know um he started that's when he started getting there and it was in that point of the game where and he just carried that through the first half and uh and that was enough and i think you know you saw that a lot from draymond pre-durant when they had these kind of warrior teams that you know maybe 
you know, like you, like you said, against LeBron without, but the two years or they, they had Durant, those nice title runs. He was more of a, a, a kind of a, a, a vocal leader and more of a shouter at his own him. team, yeah, at his own team. Him. He was more of a, he would muck up when he was kind of, you know, instigating his own huddle more to get those guys lifted. And he was like, he, like he's playing that role back when they were a 215, 216 team going for a title, um, trying to muck up what the other team does well instead of enhancing what his team did well, which he kind of did during the Durant years. He, it, when Kevin Durant was on that team, he was Flavor Flav. Mm -hmm. like, bro, you ain't got to, you don't need to know low, no lyrics. Just, <laughs> yeah, boy. Where, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wear the big watch around That's your it. neck. That's it. Give us a chance to catch our breath. You go, Raise you walk the roof. Up. Yeah, you do You do some call and response to the audience, and then, then we'll get back to the actual music that people paid to see. I There's a reason, <laughs> exactly. There's a reason Flavor Flav never had an album, bro. There's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Draymond Green is Flavor Flav. And I'm it, it, the idea that he gets so much credit for his impact on the game, which he does have an impact on the game. I'm not saying he doesn't. But the fact that Steve Kerr and, and, and Steph Curry have trusted him to do certain things has empowered him. He talks to the referees like he's Steph Curry. Bro, you are not. Like, and if as a referee, what why would a referee take that like seriously yeah you know i mean the nba has its you know inner workings there's there's you know there's no i mean it's it's probably not advertised but come on these guys know when a guy gets three fouls and if who he is right like they know they they know like this guy's got three and then if he's how many rings or all-star games has he been to that fourth one he's you know he, he's got a lot of leeway to get his fourth whereas you know the guy with two that hasn't been anywhere that's playing hot off the bench that's signed from a G League team. He uh, he he looks at Steph Curry wrong. He's gonna pick up a third. If, so if they Durant, that, that's an unwritten rule in the NBA, especially when it's a home game for one team and a road game for another. If Grant Williams had done what Draymond Green did to Jalen Brown, if Grant Williams had done that to Clay Thompson and he had already had a technical, he'd have gotten a second one. Oh yeah. And then, like it's it's not there's like, no doubt. I, and it would have been a theatrical show tossing him from the game. Yes. Bam, you're gone. That crowd would have went crazy. They would have helped Clay up. Clay would have jawed from there. They would have had to hold him off. Rod Grant Williams. It would have been a big old theatrical play out. So I I just there's so many facets of the game that need to be played at a high level once you reach the finals. And it's too often denied because Alex on on Kaplan and Crew said that oh, he reminds me of Dennis Rodman, and 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 I no. that's like the third time I've heard someone say that, and I'm and, and I'm telling you, he he doesn't have the athleticism or the mental capacity for basketball that Dennis Rodman had for people to be like oh well they're they both the antics I'm like no again, Dennis Rodman took Karl Malone out of the game. Mm -hmm. Dennis Rodman took Shaquille O'Neal out of the game. Not Jalen Brown. Like, these aren't – it's not the same. No. Yeah, and, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, the guy that had the game that, you know, is uh, uh, always, uh, you know, kind of complimented to Draymond, right? The kind of game that, you know, you expect from Draymond, the, the, the game you want Draymond to have. I'll tell you, the guy that had a great two-way game last night, and it was a great floor game, and it was everything, is Andrew Wiggins. Andrew yes. Wiggins played a team unselfish floor game at both ends. He moved without the ball. He created second shots. He worked, made Tatum. He, whenever he was assigned, you know, Tatum got some good shots off when Peyton was on him and, and when and and when Wiggins was on him. But Wiggins was out guarding a multiple of different guys on the floor throughout. He had assignments. Uh, he adapted to the whole uh, strategy that Steve Kerr had to bring to to kind of slow this Boston team down. And run them at the three. I thought Andrew Wiggins. I I watched that kind of play. You know the stuff that it, guys aren't. You know, putting up points. He wasn't getting a ton of shots. He hit some big shots. He hit a big shot with a shot clock going down in the first half. One time, one possession. And I just, 
I love the game Wiggins plays, and I think he's playing more as an athlete and a scorer type into that Draymond Green, what do I do for you uh, role. And he's steady. He keeps his head about him. You know, uh, I, I was really impressed with the finals game two that Wiggins had um, facing that they were down 0-1 that, you know, did he need to be a scorer? We don't know. We're going to see. Does he need to be a facilitator? Is he going to need to be a scrap defender, or a rebounder, or a guy that slashes with the ball? And I thought he just did exactly what that team needed um, yesterday to be successful, getting Steph free, uh, eventually making sure Clay could get into the party a little bit, um, you know, providing that pool was well, going to we'll, get shots come we'll off the see. bench how game three goes on Wednesday, because no one knows. I, I think what we've realized about Boston is their performances are unpredictable yes. from game to game. The consistency of the Warriors is it, it can't even override it. So again, like you said, the Warriors will get to around 108, 109. We'll get to more when we come back on Browner and Lawhead right here on the Mightier 1090 ESPN. Second half of the show, John Browner joined by Jason Lawhead. We call this Browner and Lawhead. Coming to you Monday through Wednesday from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. on the My Dear 1090 ESPN. Big ups to uh, Bill Hagen for getting Jim Rome back on the show. Rome's yeah, amazing, home is what huh? we're calling it. So that's been that's been great to have Rome's voice back on the station where it all began. Um, we've we've talked about a lot on the show so far in concerns to the NBA Finals, the games one and game two, because obviously we do Monday through Wednesday, so we missed the uh, Thursday Friday shows, and so we don't get a chance to kind of talk about things later in the week. And so we just did a little catch up with that segment. Now we're going to break down a couple of things where we like to call out a chatter, <laughs> chatter. This is. A little this baseball a chatter. Hey, batter, a batter. Baseball, a hey, batter, 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 batter. A little baseball chatter. I just thought of that. How about that? Nice. Boom, boom, boom. We'll call this segment batter, batter, baseball chatter. Uh, I don't know if anybody noticed, but the Padres are showing you game after game. This isn't last year's team. This isn't the collapse of last year. A lot of people threw dirt on the team when they brought everybody back. When AJ Preller said, "Listen, dude." I'm bringing everybody back because I think what happened was a once in a generation, once in a decade kind of thing. That isn't this team. That isn't these players. We just had a weird flame out to the end of the year. I think he believed in this roster. And I think bringing that roster back with all the guys who had that collapse has actually made this team better going forward in ways that only you can know by experiencing something. Because the pitching has been what's carried them. The offense has been hit and miss. But nevertheless, as good as their pitching has been, they're scoring four runs, that'll get you a win on this team. That'll get this team a win if you score four runs. And I think that's starting to seep through to a bunch of the guys on the roster. Just get us four or five. We won't win every game with four or five, but just get us four or five, and we've got an 80, 70 to 80% chance of winning this thing. Yeah. And, and the nights you get, and, you know, and the nights you explode, the bats explode for six, seven, right. eight, nine runs. We're, we're not going to. We're not going to let you down, right, on those nights. We're not going to make you have to outslug somebody when you do put up uh, video game numbers. So the other big thing is, is I think you're right. I think the fact that he kept all those guys together, you know, there's the old adage that, oh, yeah, just firing the manager ain't going to fix anything. But that's what he committed to. He said, you know what? I actually believe in everything right. here. I'm not right. trying to fix this. I'm going to go fix. I'm going to go. We're going we're gonna to go fix the manager situation. I'm going to bring in a guy, and I'm not just going to go replace him with another guy that we haven't had any experience before like we tried this time. We're going to go out and get a guy that has shown that he can win with all kinds of different major league rosters, good ones, mm -hmm. you know, mediocre ones, uh, low payroll, minor league, you know, project, all that kind of stuff, patchwork pitching staffs, and – uh, because I believe in you guys that much that I just think it's just that much of a tweak. And right now he looks like a genius in yes. that, in that, in that sense of that's the tweak because my franchise player isn't even playing the guy that we've sold your whole, you know, future of season tickets on why you should be a Padres fan forever. Isn't even out on the field. Um, and they've got some of them. And they, I think they've got the third most wins in baseball, third or fourth most wins yeah. in baseball without their best player. Allegedly, right. playing some player. of the best road baseball, and even though they were yes. swept 
by the St. Louis, who just seems to have that in their number. You know, once a team gets confident over a couple of years on you, right? Every time St. Louis mm-hmm. just feels like, you know, that was a, a, a huge last year was the big separate the the, the, the the big series that mathematically eliminated the Padres last year was when they went to St. Louis and just got their clocks cleaned in right. September. It just seems to be one of those things. But they bounce right back and get a sweep, right? And uh, so that's the type of mind frame, right? That's the kind of that that swept that sweep last year would have milked into more losses like it did all the time. All the time, something like that happened and milked into more losses. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think Melvin's presence, obviously. I mean, this is going to be fun. I mean, you, it's almost like, man, you know, now it's a, a rush to get to tease back in the sense of wanting him back for seeing what's going to happen. Obviously you don't want to rush him back, but um, right. And now you don't. And and now, because I think this is part of the reason that the success is sustainable and it will lead to greater success down the road because you don't have to rush the teeth back. Right. Whenever he's ready, he's ready because look at the way that the team has performed without him. And I hope that that gives them a sense of calm going forward that we don't have to run this guy back right away because we don't necessarily need him until he's 100 percent healthy right and you know uh you know and even when he comes back if he if he if he's swinging the bat and he's feeling good there you can always just kind of dh him to kind of save any on the field injuries mm-hmm. to early on you just make sure that that wrist isn't getting you know caught up in a play or 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 something tangled up with another player so uh, you know, you have options to kind of bring him in and ease him in if he's in the cage hitting the ball well, but you still want to kind of make sure that that wrist gets full time to to heal without any contact, uh, you know, at least, it, you know, other than a, the possibility of a pitch hitting him. But um, it's going to be exciting when he comes back, you know, especially like you said, this team is sustainable. This is a team that if, if he right. was out for the year, like if we would have found out before the season, Tatis is out for the year, you got to play with him out for the year. You'd be at this point going, hey, look, this team is still sustainable. They're winning on the road. Uh, they've played more games out on the road. Wait till they get a couple more home stands here in the nice warmer weather and, you know, get the fans behind them. Uh, and all of a sudden, you know, if they can, you know, rip through june and july by playing this kind of the same percentage win percentage baseball uh this is a i also that, think yeah. i also think one of the things that, that has really gotten uh people off their back is the whole idea of yo you can't beat winning teams yes we've beat bad teams but we are our, our record against uh, winning teams we're under 500 now it is 500 now it's 13 and 13 and and the idea that you but that's baseball to, that's all yes. that's sports. Yes. You play you play the best yes. of about 500 teams at around 500. That's you know, the great teams exceed that. But because guess what? That's what happens in a in a in an October series. It's got if it goes 7, you won either 4 to 3 or lost 3 to 4. The idea right that under people, under above 500. People spend a lot of time trying to play games on the schedule that aren't here yet. Yeah. And so for me I I I I hope more people exercise the idea of we can only beat the teams we're playing that day. So do that, and at the end, when it shakes all out, then we'll have the conversation of, oh, this is who you beat, this is who you didn't beat. But I got full confidence that these guys will be able to go for it. And like tonight against the Mets, the Mets are a good team. They pretty much did a number on the Dodgers, so I'm interested to see how they come into Petco because the Mets, again, are a good team. If we can scrape three out of four here, I think we'll be in really good shape going forward. And I think this will get a lot of the chatter about them, whether or not they're quote unquote real off their back. So and there's always that. Yeah. It'd be nice to see wins from Snell and Darvish out of the head of the yeah, series. Cause then you can sit there and go, I don't care what you say our record is, you know, our top two arms in our staff are beating division leaders, beating teams that are, have the best, you know, one of the best records in baseball. So that's where you go. You go, can, can Snell, can Darvish, can you guys go out and lead us to wins against this kind of team? playing this kind of baseball because that is going to tell me more about what we can do in October than just the whole big picture of what's a, are you one game under 500 or one game over 500 versus above 500? Um, that's what I want to see. I want to see Snell and, and Darvish be able to go up against a lineup like this, a team like this playing their, their kind of baseball and be able to go get wins from them. And that's, that, that's the kind of feeling you go, Oh, you know, when October rolls around, we got we got guys that are not afraid to go up and 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 shut down an offense like this or a baseball team like this. So, this is my I I love 
the topic of popularity. Mm-hmm. Elon Musk is now apparently going full throat and attempting to not buy Twitter. His argument is that it is it doesn't have the members that it publicly said it did or that it portrays to have had. I got news for Elon Musk. Bro, if you were actually on Twitter, you would have known it's mostly bots. It's yeah. mostly bots. It's mostly like you, bots. You attempted to buy something for $44 million that is mostly bots because you're rich and you tried to do something super rich guy and overpay for something that you didn't need and that you really probably only wanted. And now look at you. Look at you now. Well, it's weird about these people that like they 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 use Twitter as the symbol of like free speech is being suppressed. Right? It's like Twitter is the high school hallway of social media. It's like this isn't the bastion of free speech just because you have a Twitter account and you want to scream about this. If you want to scream about your right for a gun or your right not to have a gun or your right for a board, your right not that this isn't the platform. This isn't. <laughs> This isn't the First Amendment. It's a app that was invented in 2009, and it's a high school hallway. It's the lockers between classes. This is what it is. It's this guy's bullying this guy, or maybe you're just use it to be friends with a group of people to talk sports or what. It's not real in the sense of your freedom. You people are insane. These people that like take Twitter to this like, oh, okay. It's like, whatever. If the guy that owns it or whoever the CEOs doesn't want you or your voice or whatever, if that's the way it is. If he wants bots, if he doesn't want bots. And if the public in the arena of life and reality can't separate, you know, can't separate it or identify it or if they're going to live through it then that's on them they're they, then that's on the user and the person that can't go back to a real life form without sliding into twitter for a little bit to see what's going on i thrum scroll through i might have a thought that's funny i might object to something say something whatever promote what what who is using this as the declaration of independence I think what Twitter has in this sale of Twitter and people's response to it and how some people have taken to Twitter to show that, quote unquote, once Elon Musk bought it, what the difference, what had started happening in likes and retweets and things of that nature. If you're that mad about it, make your own app like it's a, it's Jack Dorsey owned Twitter. He could do whatever he wants with it. He created it. He's the owner of it. And if Elon Musk buys it, by the way. He could do whatever the hell he wants with it because now he owns it. Like it's you're not entitled to the app. The weirdest, the weirdest thing is we this Elon Musk guy gets credit for being so such a genius and so smart. And, and he's gonna solve so many problems. This was he's the a dick. this was he's the a prediction. Dick. This, but this was the prediction of the guy. This guy's gonna solve so many of our problems and our issues as a world. And it's one thing to be Jack Dorsey. God bless the person. That started Twitter because, hey, man, social media, I'm going to start this thing and it's going to be called tweets and you can retweet them and whatever. And God bless the guy that did that. And it becomes worth whatever it becomes worth, whether it's a faux 44 million. Whatever you'll pay for it. It's worth whatever Yeah, exactly. For. Whether whether you want to treat it like what it's actually worth, right? Or if you want to treat it like it's some rare Babe Ruth card and you want to have it more than anybody and you'll pay $6 million for whatever it is, then you can treat it like that. But for a guy, you know, for, for Twitter to become whatever it's worth, God bless Jack Dorsey because he did that and that's what he created and it developed into that. But to be some supposed innovative mind, this guy that's going to solve the world's problems, he could he can potentially have the ideas to solve, you know, energy crises and food crises, which really, you know, he's just limping along with it, 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 more talk than I, I can actually see real uh, definite solutions here. Why are you going to spend $44 billion of all the intelligent things you can do and, and, and the things that you can actually change? Why would this app, where it's gotten to in 2022 from where it started, no matter what it's worth, why would you want to spend $44 billion to own that? Is, is this something in our world that is needs to be fixed so bad? The ideas and the thoughts 
in the minds of people that talk in bumper sticker language. I mean, that's what we're doing because that's what Twitter just is. You know, it's just you watch this gun debate, whether it's a a, a, a hard right you know lawmaker or a hard left progressive that doesn't want to. It's just like these people speak. If you did an autopsy of their brains, there would be a bumper sticker inside. And this is what we're saving. This is the this is the resource on earth that is so precious for 44 so billion valuable. freaking dollars. You're going to go save and uplift and create a utopia of society where everything's fair on Twitter. Get a clue. The people that follow this guy and, and hero worship him. I mean, this hero worshiping from all of these people to all of these people, whoever they hero worship is become a sick cult like gluttony of the mind in yes. america and it's sad dude it's sad whether it's rogan or musk or you know whoever it might be andrew yang i don't know i'm just trying to pick names of the, right i'm just anybody who you would sit there and go oh, this guy's the smartest the best the crypto guy who ever thought that is the smartest greatest guy like get a, get a clue get a freaking clue man Oh my God. Have Andrew some of your own self ambitions instead of living through the promises of ambitions of others. I mean, and, and, Dude, and I, the whole like, the, you're, you're, because what you're doing is you are just, you are the low hanging fruit that is being plucked <laughs> every day by these people. This, that, listen, that's who they make their money off of. And I think that the people who are being juiced don't realize that they're being juiced. Because they're being refilled yes. because they need to be juiced again. Right. So I because they read the next bumper stickers yes. uh that this yes. person puts out and they go, Oh my god, that makes so much sense. It's like, does so, it? It's two sentences of a lot of stuff you could punch holes in. Going from one person who really is not liked by a lot of people in Elon Musk to someone who literally isn't liked by almost his entire sport in Phil Mickelson. I don't I don't know Phil Mickelson. I've heard really bad stories about Phil Mickelson as a person. But I will tell you this. Any man who wants to work, who isn't hurting anybody, should be allowed to work. So this golf tournament, the live golf tournament that's, that, will, that will be mostly done in Europe, is basically four, to me. Four, we have four tournament spots here too, though. To me, this is the ABA. Now, not in the style or the pace or, you know what I'm saying, or the racial color makeup of it. This is what the USFL wanted to be, actually. This, this is more of be, what the USFL yes. hoped to succeed at. And we'll see and if this, this thing succeeds. We'll see. And, but it has a lot more money. These Saudi Arabian guys are for real. They're not fake Donald Trumps in 1984 who have like 20 hotels in debt. These guys own countries. And I the, think the, the, yeah. that the I, I think that this golf tournament, will rival and if if they last 10 years which because like you said financially there's no reason why they wouldn't unless they right. just got disinterested the reason why this is going to work because it's financially backed by the right people and two it will have staying power if this thing goes for a decade and they can get as many uh, uh dates on the calendar as the pga they'll start getting better golfers or golfers as good as the pga because Every major sport thinks that no one can compete with them. Like, it, through sheer bodies, no one can compete with the NFL. But at one point in time, someone attempted to. And at one point in time in our country, the, ne the Negro League competed with Major League Baseball. And uh, um, obviously, soccer has a million competing divisions, not necessarily leagues. But the NBA, to my knowledge, and the AFL, as, as you were breaking it down, the NBA had a problem with the ABA. It was funner, it was faster, mm -hmm. and it had color to it. They had a massive problem. They were stealing good players and putting and providing a more entertaining brand of basketball. And after no the doubt. NBA turned their nose up at it, realized it was working, they went, oh, okay, that works. How much? Let's merge. And so they did. And I think that's what's going to happen with this because they're going to – because the first guy always gets his ass kicked. And Phil Mickelson was the first guy who come out and said something. And so he got drugged through the mud for what he said, and he went rightfully so. But nevertheless, he made the decision that he yeah. thought was right for him financially. And so I take my hat off to him. 
Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, you know, obviously it's an individual sport, um, which is the the real kind of just different wedge through this thing. But, yeah, I mean, I, you know, right now, as you just – that little take you just had is an interesting viewpoint because it's kind of what Al Davis did in the old AFL. He's kind of being – Al Davis in a sense of how Al Davis challenged the NFL. And then eventually the NFL said, well, let's just go into business with these guys instead of trying to beat them. Um, the NBA, very similar, right? You're absolutely right. The ABA was funner. It was a funner league. And uh, if the only way the NBA was going to grow to its, is, uh, its, its zenith was to say, what can we do with the ABA to make the right. game of basketball one? Uh, whereas, you know, I think the USFL was just too late in the game. They were, you know, and, and football is different, right? Like it's hard to find a, a really body. good, it's really good. It's hard to find a real, really 12, really good starting quarterbacks in a 30 team league. You, you know, need body you need bodies, because right? You need, need a lot of bodies and, 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 bodies. and the, and the game has a short shelf life. Whereas this yeah. LIV uh, tour, I mean, there's the fields are deep. It's an individual sport. There's so much young talent. The next Tiger Woods is and the next Phil Mickelson's are all around the corner. I mean, you see now, I mean, Rory McIlroy, these guys are the ones that are starting to get old because these young Morikawas and these young dudes that are just coming up as chefs, these guys, they're everywhere and they just keep feeding the pipeline. And I so there's right going to be good players to play in these, these tours. And if the big guys stay and they have staying power, you're right. And with the pockets, the Saudis have. Uh, and uh, if this league, if if this tournament, if this whatever it's going by, if they find themselves on the cusp of the next Tiger Woods, the PGA will negotiate with them because mm -hmm. I'm telling you, at some point there will be another Tiger Woods. And now you're, there will be a race to find him. Well, what's the PGA? The, yeah. These Saudis will pay you directly. Right. They'll just go, how much? You yeah, it's fifty million dollars. Like, who gives a damn? Come play golf with us. Don't yeah. Go, go shoot there. an eighty-two all weekend. I don't care. We Here's just shot a hundred. We'll be back tomorrow. Brown and Lawhead. See y'all tomorrow. Mighty to ninety ESPN. Peace.